different perspectives on the same thing within the Bible. Uh, and that's actually kind of what we're going to talk about tonight, is, uh, is various, um, various perspectives specifically dealing um, with the role of women in the church uh, and, and society and with uh, slavery and, and the institution of slavery. Um, so if you've been part of our Bible studies before, you'll know that one of the first things that I do whenever we introduce a new book of the Bible that we're studying is that we talk a little bit about the authorship uh, and the date in which it was written. Uh, and perhaps you have wondered um, where do we come up with that information? You know, when we, when we say this book was probably not actually written by, uh, you know, the the Apostle John, how, how, why, why are we saying that? Um, and, you know, sometimes I've given you some explanations, you know, for instance, probably, probably the reason that, that none of the Gospels were at least a first-person written account from Jesus' disciples is probably because Jesus' disciples were illiterate, because they were all Galilean fishermen, and this was a time when the literacy rate was somewhere around 10%. Um, you know, it was, it was a very slim uh, minority of the population that knew how to read and write, and fishermen were usually not among that, uh, that slim margin. Um, but big picture, the way that we get a sense of, of who wrote the books of the Bible and when they were written uh, is something that's uh, called biblical criticism or critical Bible scholarship. Uh, and you might think of, of criticism, you know, as we usually use the term today, like criticism is like negative feedback, like, you know, this is not good. Um, but, but the critical method of biblical scholarship really basically means that you, uh, you study the Bible under a microscope, very carefully and very closely comparing it to itself, to other passages, uh, within the same book of the Bible, to other books of the Bible, to other writings of ancient literature from that time period. Basically, you analyze it um, with the same sort of scholarly rigor that you would analyze any other ancient text. You know, just like you probably had a, a class on Shakespeare at some point when you were in high school, right? Um, that kind of a scholarly approach to the text, but applied to the Bible. Uh, and we're going to talk about the, the critical method of biblical scholarship tonight. Um, specifically, we're going to talk about the letters of Paul. Paul is, without a doubt, uh, the person who has uh, authored more books of our Bible than any other individual. There are 13 books in the New Testament that are attributed to Paul. Uh, and when I say they are attributed to Paul, I don't mean in the same sense that like we say Matthew's Gospel is, a, is attributed to Matthew, but if you actually read Matthew's Gospel, nowhere does it say, I, Matthew, am writing to let you know, right? Like, there are 13 letters in the New Testament that specifically say, I, Paul, am writing this letter to you. Like, his name is right there in the greeting uh, at the beginning of the letter. 13 letters that are attributed to Paul. However, the overwhelming consensus among Bible scholars is that Paul did not actually write all 13 letters that bear his name. Um, some of them, even most of them, were written by Paul, um, but some of them were not. And the way that Bible scholars come to that conclusion is by using the critical method of biblical scholarship. So the first ones that we're going to talk about um, are what are sometimes called the Deutero-Pauline letters. Those are Ephesians, Colossians, and 2 Thessalonians. The reason they're called the Deutero-Pauline letters is because they kind of sound like Paul. There are definitely elements of Paul in the letters, but there are definitely elements uh, that are inconsistent with the other letters that scholars agree were written by Paul. Uh, the, the way that we analyze this is, is referred to as redaction criticism. That's the, the school of, uh, of textual critical scholarship, redaction criticism. And the way that I explain this to people is, it's like if you are a teacher 
and you've been teaching this same kid for the last four months, five months, you can tell when they have copied and pasted something from the internet. Because it just doesn't sound like them, right? Like the sentence structure is different. All of a sudden their vocabulary is different. Uh, they're using words that they, they have not ever used before in, in anything that they have submitted to you. You can just, once you have gotten a feel for how someone writes, you can tell when something is written by somebody else. And that's the way that, that, that scholars have flagged Ephesians, Colossians, and 2 Thessalonians as probably not authentic Pauline epistles. Many of the important terms uh, in those things, that, that in those letters, that the author of those letters spends a lot of their time focused on, Paul doesn't talk about at all in his other letters. So the, the heavenly places, dividing wall, fellow citizen, those phrases just don't show up in the other Pauline epistles uh, where they show up frequently in these. Um, some of the, the language that Paul uses elsewhere is either given new meaning or is completely absent. So basically the vocabulary shifts. There are some words that Paul uses a lot that don't show up in these three letters. And conversely, there are some words that are used a lot in these three letters uh, that Paul doesn't use elsewhere. They're called the Deuteropauline letters. Deutero just literally means second Paul. So these are the letters that uh, scholars think that these might have been written by somebody who actually knew Paul, who actually met Paul, or at least has done a, a pretty good study of what Paul has written. So they kind of sound like Paul, but with a careful examination, they also don't sound like the language changes, the, the, the style of writing, the sentence structure changes. Um, Bible scholars date those letters, uh, Ephesians, Colossians, and 2 Thessalonians, to somewhere between 75 and 180. Um, so that's, a, that's sort of a range of time uh, that comes basically right after Paul's life, uh, about a generation removed from Paul. Now, there are other letters uh, that are sometimes called the pastoral epistles, uh, First and Second Timothy and Titus. Um, the Bible scholars are even more certain were not written by Paul. Uh, and one of the, the dead giveaways on these um, is that uh, they talk about events and they talk about the church in such a way that it just doesn't make sense for Paul's own lifetime. Uh, for example, I've got a couple of Bible verses here. Uh, so if you look at 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 17. So 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 17, um, says, This the saying is sure, whoever aspires to the office of bishop desires a noble task. Now a bishop must be above reproach, married only once, temperate, sensible, respectable, hospitable, an apt teacher, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, and not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, keeping his children submissive and respectful in every way. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may be puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace and the snare of the devil. And then if you look at Titus, which is just going to come a couple of letters later, uh, Titus 1, 5 through 9 also deals with the office of the bishop. I left you behind in Crete for this reason, so that you should put in order what remained to be done, and should appoint elders in every town as I directed you, someone who is blameless and married only once, whose children are believers, not accused of debauchery and not rebellious. For a bishop, as God's steward, must be blameless. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or addicted to wine or violent or greedy for gain. You see where this is going. It sounds very much like the, the last passage, right? These are the, the um, characteristics 
that a leader of the church that a bishop should possess. But the office of bishop wasn't really a thing during Paul's time. I mean, you got to remember the Apostle Paul was the guy that was going traveling all around the Mediterranean world planting new churches in new communities, right? During Paul's time, the, the church was still very much one of sort of a ragtag bunch of people. They all believe in, in, in this Jesus message, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, but, but there is not an institutional church at this point, right? This is still when believers are getting together, reading the scriptures, talking together in one another's homes. We don't have church buildings yet. We don't have an institutional church yet, right? Like the, the church is just getting started during Paul's lifetime. Um, and so it just totally makes no sense for actual Paul uh, to be writing extensively about the office of the bishop when the office of the bishop really wasn't a thing uh, in Paul's own lifetime. Uh, so these letters are dated by biblical scholars to sometime in the range of 100 to 150 AD. So these come after Second Paul. Uh, or Deuteropal, right? Those, uh, those first three letters, um, Ephesians, Colossians, Second Thessalonians, these come even later than that, sometime between 100 and 150 AD. And again, the reason that we know that is because these letters just address situations that were not happening during Paul's own lifetime. They address situations that come up after. So that leaves us with our authentic letters of Paul, that all Bible scholars agree like, yep, when it says, I, Paul, am writing to you, the Church of Rome, it's actually Paul writing to the Church of Rome. And I'll just, I'll just really quickly say, um, if this seems like scandalous or lying, like this, um, this was actually a pretty common practice in the ancient world. Um, you know, today we, we have sort of a more modern academic sensibility. We would call, you know, putting your name on someone else's work or putting someone else's name on your work cheating, lying. Uh, but it was, it was a very widespread pa practice uh, in the ancient world. You know, now if you start, you know, copying and pasting things in your term paper and you turn it in, like, that'll get you flunked out of college, right? But in the ancient world, this was, uh, it was, it was a very common practice, for instance, uh, for students to write in the name of their teacher. That was considered a respectful way of giving credit to the person who taught you, uh, is, is that you would write in their name. Uh, and then, of course, there was, um, just as there is today, you know, sometimes people will put a quote up on the internet, and let's just attribute that to George Washington, because people respect George Washington, and so we'll say George Washington said it, even though he never actually did, right? Um, there was some of that going on as well, that, um, that if you wanted to put some authority behind what you were writing, well, then you would write in the name of Paul because Paul was a respected authority. Um, Paul was widely regarded uh, as an as a important uh, founder of many Christian communities in the Mediterranean world. So, I mean, that was going on. But this, this was, in fact, a very common practice. Uh, there was even a, a Roman physician I forget his name now, but he wrote an entire book that was basically talking about the books that were written in his name, but that he didn't write. Like he took the time to write a whole book saying, and this book over here titled this, it's not actually written by me, and these are the things that I would disagree with. Like he, it was, it was widespread, widespread in the ancient world. It's not like they have the internet where you can just go on and fact check these things in 15 seconds if you want to, right? Um, so that leaves us with the authentic Pauline letters, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, 1 Thessalonians, and Philemon. Um, and those, basically every Bible scholar agrees, these were all written by Paul. And these were probably written sometime very early, uh, between like 50 and 60, 65 AD. That's, that's about Paul's lifetime. Right? So if it's actually written by Paul, it has to be written during his lifetime. Um, and most of them are dated in that 50 to 60 AD range. So, interesting bit of history. 
but does that actually mean anything to us as Christians? Well, maybe. So let's look uh, at some questions that are meaningful to us uh, as Christians, as believers. Um, and then as I mentioned uh, a little earlier, before we started the study, is also a thing that often comes up among non-believers. Uh, very often, one of the, the, the criticisms that you will hear people levy against Christianity and the church is, well, the church supported slavery. Uh, the, church, the church supported slavery. And that's true. That is true. Um, there were many churches that, uh, that were actively working to continue the institution of slavery in this country. And they were quoting Bible verses to do it. And we're going to look at some of those Bible verses. Uh, and then again, you know, like I said, there were also a lot of churches that were working to abolish the institution of slavery in this country and were quoting Bible verses to do it. Um, and we're going to look at some of these verses. So here's the way that I want to do it. We're going to look at these verses in chronological order, in the order in which they were written. Remember, authentic letters of Paul written between 50 and 60 A.D. And Jesus would have died sometime around 30, 35 A.D. You know, where there's, there's a little bit of debate on exactly what year was he born. Was he actually born, you know, do we have that year 1 A.D. right or not? There's a little disagreement, but that's a pretty narrow in 30 to 33, uh, 33 to 35 A.D., right? There's somewhere in there. So if Paul's writing 50 to 60 AD, you're basically one generation removed from Jesus Christ at this point, right? One generation. This is the earliest writing that we have on the subject of slavery. Authentic Paul. What does Paul say about slavery? Well, we're going to go ahead and take a look at one of the authentic letters of Paul, which is Philemon. Right before Hebrews. Um, so, uh, basically, the whole letter of Philemon is uh, Paul talking about a slave, a runaway slave named Onesimus. Um, and Onesimus has become a friend of Paul and has converted to Christianity. And Onesimus is now going back to his former slave owner, Philemon, the, the person for whom the letter is named, the person that the letter is addressed to. Um, and Paul, uh, in a not so subtle way, uh, argues that Philemon should uh, free his slave and welcome him as a brother. Because he's a Christian now, and you. If you are all one in Christ, how can you possibly treat this person as a slave when he's your brother? And I want us to specifically look uh, here at verses 15 through 21. Perhaps this is the reason he was separated for, from you for a while, so that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. I will say nothing about your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, let me have this benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I am writing to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. That's how Paul tells Philemon to treat his slave Onesimus. Welcome him back, not as a slave, but as a brother. Now, um, think about the precedent that that would set. Right? Because, because one of the things that people will point out is, well, this is only a specific instance of this specific slave who has converted to Christianity. And so Paul is saying, well, if he's, a, if he's a Christian, if he is your brother in Christ, you can't treat him as a slave anymore. Um, 
But if, if the precedent that is set is when you become a Christian, your Christian slave owner should set you free, boy, that seems like a really great incentive to become a Christian if you are a slave, right? <laughs> Like, if, if that's the precedent, if that's the rule that's established in the early Christian church, is we will not own our fellow Christians, I can't imagine that there would be very many slaves who would be like, no, I think I'm going to stay not a Christian and stay a slave, right? Um, certainly, uh, if it's not an attack on the entire institution of slavery, Paul creates what is almost certainly the biggest loophole to get out of slavery that you can imagine uh, creating. If, if this is a fellow believer, then that's your brother in Christ. You cannot keep them as a slave at that point. Right? They, they have become your brother in Christ. You can't keep them as a slave. So that's the earliest writing on the question of slavery that we have um, in the Bible. Again, authentic, authentic letter of Paul sometime between 50 and 60 AD. One generation removed from Jesus. So now, let's skip ahead another generation to the letters that were written 75 to 100 AD. So now we're going to be two generations removed from Jesus, one generation removed from Paul himself. And we are going to take a look first at Colossians 3, 22 through chapter 4, verse 1. Starting at verse 22, Colossians 3, 22. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything not only while being watched and in order to please them, but wholeheartedly fearing the Lord. Whatever your task, put yourselves into it, as done for the Lord and not for your masters. Since you know that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward, you serve the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for whatever has been done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your slaves justly and fairly, for you know that you also have a master in heaven. So we're one generation removed from Paul, two generations removed from Jesus. What's changed? Well, now there seems to be an assumption that your fellow believers can be slaves, right? Paul said if, if they're a believer in Christ, they're your brother, and you can't keep them as a slave. Um, now we're a generation later, since this is, this is written to a church, right? This is written to the Colossian church. Um, those slaves that, that this letter is written to would be Christians. They would be believers. Um, so we've, we've lost that assumption that if somebody is your brother in Christ, you don't get to keep them as a slave. Um, but what do we have here? Well, there's... Letters that are, there's uh, directives that are addressed to both to the slaves and to the masters, right? Masters, you're supposed to treat your slaves justly. Remember that you also have a master in heaven. Slaves, you're supposed to work hard trying to please your master just as you would try to work hard for the Lord. Uh, we're going to see something very similar in Ephesians, which is going to be actually two back. I don't know why I put them in that order because we're actually going to flip back in the Bible to get there. Um, but if we read um, Ephesians 6, 5 through 9, very similar language. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, in singleness of heart as you obey Christ, not only while being watched in order to please them, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Render service with enthusiasm as to the Lord and not to men and women knowing that whatever good we do, we will receive the same again from the Lord, whether we are slaves or free. And masters, do the same to them. Stop threatening them, for you know that both of you have the same master in heaven, and with him there is no partiality. So you get very similar language again here. Gone is the assumption that if somebody is your brother in Christ, 
they can no longer be your slave. That assumption that Paul had in Philemon. We get very similar instructions. All right, slaves, work hard, try to please your masters just like you would try to please God. And masters, you need to be kind and just with your slaves, right? Stop threatening them because you know you won't have the same master in heaven. So slavery is still around. But there's at least some language about if you're going to have slaves, if you know, if you are going to have Christian slaves, you've got to treat them well. You have to treat them in a Christian way. Treat them justly. So that's two generations removed from Jesus, one generation removed from Paul. Now let's skip ahead a couple more generations. Go to the stuff written between 100 and 150 AD. We're going to look at Titus. First and second Thessalonians, first and second Timothy, and then Titus. So if we look at Titus 2.9, what do we get in Titus 2.9? Tell slaves to be submissive to their masters and to give satisfaction in every respect. They are not to talk back not to pilfer, but to show complete and perfect fidelity so that in everything may be, may be an ornament to the doctrine of God our Savior. And that's where it stops. So, now we're somewhere three to four generations removed from Jesus, two to three generations removed from Paul, and see what's happened. For one thing, there's no directions in here at all about masters you need to treat your slaves in a way that is respectful and just and kind, right? That language is gone. And not only that, but the letter doesn't even address itself directly to the slaves, right? In those first two letters it says, slaves do this. Here it says, tell the slaves to do this. We're not even talking to them like they're in the room anymore. Tell the slaves to do this. Obey perfectly. And there's no instruction whatsoever as to how masters are supposed to treat their slaves. You can see that there's sort of this pretty clear trajectory that goes on. The longer, the farther we get away from Jesus and from Paul. So there's that question, does, does the Bible condone slavery? Well, the answer has to be yes and no. It depends on which passages of scripture you're looking at. But I think it's interesting that the closer you go to the original founding of the Christian church, to where you're within a generation of Jesus, even if it doesn't say just slave, free all the slaves, it does give a pretty big loophole for the slaves to walk through, right? You cannot enslave someone if they are also a believer in Christ because they are your brother in Christ. Like I said, when, when slavery was a, an issue being fought over in this country, there were Christian churches that were fighting to maintain the institution of slavery, and they were quoting passages like, those found in Titus, Colossians, Ephesians. And there were those who were quoting passages, churchgoers who were trying to end slavery. Quoting passages like those found in Philemon and some of the teachings of Jesus about how we're supposed to treat one another. It's both. But the closer we get to the original founding of the church, the more anti-slavery the theology of the text. So let's look at another question, right? Another thing that sometimes people say, oh, I can't, can't believe in the Bible, can't believe in Jesus, can't believe in Christianity because, because the Christian church is super sexist. Certainly there's, there's some truth to that, right? I mean, there, there are churches that, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the first community that I ever served as a pastor, um, 
they got a young new pastor in another church in that community. And mind you, this is in a, in a denomination and in a tradition that ordains women as clergy. Not every denomination does that. There are still, there are still denominations of, of Christian churches that won't, won't allow female clergy, won't allow female pastors. This guy was in one of the traditions that did. He got real excited about some Bible passages that say that women are supposed to be submissive and silent. And when he came to that church, he said that women could not serve on the church council and women could not teach Sunday school. That those were both positions that gave too much leadership and too much authority to women. And our church got a lot bigger from all of the people who left his church to come to ours. <laughs> Um, but it's true, right? There, there are, there are, there are denominations. Um, there, there are churches. You can go out and Google this stuff. Like there are pastors standing in the pulpit saying that the the way that this country got off on the wrong track was the day that we started letting women vote. Um, that that is a theology that very much exists in some parts of the Christian church, and of course. There are also the flip side of, the, of that coin. There are denominations, there are churches that are out there fighting for, uh, for the rights of women, fighting for uh, female equality, fighting for reproductive issues that are, that are out there advocating on behalf of women. And again, just like the churches that try to suppress women and use their their religious views in the Bible to do so. There are churches that are fighting for women using their religious views in the Bible to do so. So let's take a look at some of the passages um, about women that you are going to find in the New Testament. And again, we're going to do the same thing we did with slavery. We're going to start with the earliest stuff. We're going to start with the stuff that every Bible scholar agrees was written by Paul sometime between 50 and 60 AD, one generation removed from Jesus. So, let's uh, take a look at 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 7. Uh, I'm just starting at verse 1 here. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is well for a man not to touch a woman. But because of cases of sexual, excuse me, sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except perhaps by agreement for a set time to devote yourselves to prayer and then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. This I say by way of concession, not a command. I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has a particular gift from God, one having one kind and another having a different kind. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead here. Um, to verse 10, uh, to the married I give this command, not I but the Lord, that the wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does separate, let her remain unmarried or else be reconciled to his husband, and that the husband should not divorce his wife. So, this is not about women's role in the church, but it is about women's role in the, in the society and in the home. What do you notice about this text? The language is equal, right? Every single thing he says. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Everything that, that Paul writes about the female in the relationship, he turns around and writes the same thing about the male in the relationship. Husband and wife, right, are put on an equal status. Anything that is commanded to, to the woman is also commanded to the man. Um, we are also going to take a look here at 1 Corinthians 11, 2 through 16. I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions just as I handed them on to you. 
But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of uh, the head of every man, and the husband is the head of his wife, and God is the head of Christ. Any man who prays or prophesies with something on his head disgraces his head, but any woman who prays or prophesies with her head unveiled disgraces her head. It is one, it is one and the same thing as and the same thing as having her head shaved. For if a woman will not veil herself, then she should be cut off. Then she should cut off her hair, uh, because if it is it is disgraceful to a woman to have her hair cut off or be shaved, she should wear a veil. For a man ought not to have his head veiled, since he is the image and reflection of God. But woman is the reflection of man. Uh, indeed, man was not made for woman, but woman for man. Um, the thing that I want to point out here. There is a little bit of unequal language that's going on here. Paul is basically saying men should not cover their heads in church and women should cover their heads in church. Um, that's a cultural practice that's going on in Paul's time and Paul thinks it's important. Uh, I'm not so concerned with whether women put a veil on when they come to church or not. But the thing that I think is important to point out is um, verse 5. But any woman who prays or prophesies with her head unveiled disgraces her head. Paul assumes that women are going to be praying and prophesying in the church, right? Men pray and prophesy, you're supposed to have your head covered. Women pray and prophesy, you're supposed to, or, yeah, head uncovered for men. Women who pray and prophesy, they're supposed to cover their head. But Paul makes the assumption that women will be praying and prophesying in the church. That's an important thing to point out, and we're going to get this again uh, in Romans 16, the very end of Romans. Again, I don't know why I put them in this order, because Romans comes before 1 Corinthians, so you've got to look backwards a little bit. But, um, but if we get to the end of Romans... There is a whole list of people that Paul wants us to greet. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church. Uh, let's see. So that you may welcome her in the Lord as is fitting for the saints and help her in whatever she may require from you. For she has been a benefactor of many and of myself as well. We greet uh, Prisca and Aquila who uh, work with me in Jesus Christ and who risk their necks for my life, to whom I only give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Uh, greet the church in their house. Um, greet Epinetus. Uh, greet Mary, who has worked very hard among you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my relatives who were in prison with me. They are prominent among the apostles. They were in Christ before I was. Phoebe. A female is a deacon of the church, right? Phoebe, that's verse 1. I commend you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church. Um, then we have, um, let's see, Mary works very hard among you. Andronicus and Junia. Junia is a female name. My relatives who were in prison with me, they are prominent among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. There, a woman is called an apostle by Paul. That's the word he uses, apostle for a woman. Clearly, Paul doesn't seem to have any problem with women filling the various roles of the church, right? Women are, are praying, prophesying, preaching, deacons, apostles, pretty much any, any category that you can stick on a church position, you know, deacons and, um, and um, apostles. Apostle's a big one. Um, apostle is, is a word that they didn't give to just anyone. But Junia, a woman, is an apostle. So, what do we see in Paul? Authentic Paul, one generation removed from Jesus, the earliest Christian church. Women can be deacons and apostles. They can pray and prophesy and preach in the churches. And in terms of their relationships in the household, in society, um, they are on an equal footing with their husbands, 
right? Whatever is true of the husband uh, is also true of the wife. Whatever is true of the wife is also true of the husband. I mean, he bends over backwards to use the exact same words. Husbands do exactly this, wives do exactly the same thing, right? They're put on equal footing. All right. So, let's jump ahead a generation. Let's get a generation away from Paul, two generations away from Jesus. Uh, let's go to Ephesians first, because even though I wrote them in a different order, uh, that will get us in the right order in the, in the Bible. That way you can flip ahead and not have to flip back. Ephesians 5, 22-33. Wives, be subject to your husbands as you are to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church, the body of which he is the Savior. Just as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, in order to make her holy by cleansing her with the washing of water by the word, so as to present the church to himself in splendor without a spot or wrinkle or anything of the kind, yes, so that she may be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as, as they do their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Um, continues on like that. Um, what do we notice? Let's maybe see if we can notice a pattern if we go to Colossians. Colossians 3, 18 through 19. Wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and never treat them harshly. Yeah, so mine says, wives, submit to your husbands. And husbands, love your wives. Yeah. <laughs> So you notice, sort of like what we had with the slaves, right? There are expectations of both people in this relationship, but those expectations are no longer equal. Where Paul had kind of bent over backwards to use the exact same language, husbands do this, wives also do the exact same thing. Now we have, there's obligations on both parties in the relationship. But it's not the same set of obligations. Husbands are supposed to love their wives. Wives are supposed to submit to their husbands. So now all of a sudden we have, we have a little different language there. You're, you're still supposed to love your wife, but your wife's supposed to obey you. Right? Now we're, now we're two generations from Jesus, one generation from Paul. Well, let's go see what Timothy has to say about this. Or 1 Timothy, rather. Um, so we go 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 15. And this is the... Uh, the that story that I told you about the young, freshly minted pastor who came to his church and told the women that they couldn't serve on the council or on the Sunday school and have the church left. Well, this is, this is what he wanted to quote. It's here in the Bible. This is straight out of the Bible. Second Timothy, no, oh, sorry, First Timothy 2. First Timothy 2, uh, starting at verse 11. Let a woman learn in silence with full submission. I permit no woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She is to keep silent. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing, provided they continue in faith and love and holiness with modesty. Propriety, yeah. Um, So, once again, no language.
language about how husbands are supposed to treat wives. We just have women. Uh, and what are women supposed to do? Learn in silence. Have babies, yeah, right? <laughs> Learn in silence with full submission. Have no authority to teach. Uh, no women are not to teach or have authority of a man. They are to keep silent, but they will be saved through childbearing, provided they continue in faith and love and holiness with modesty. That's it, right? That's Shut up and have babies. That's Basically what you get there. Shut up and have babies. But again, again, we are now uh, two to three generations removed from Paul. We're three to four generations removed from Jesus. Uh, Jesus himself said some pretty interesting things about women. Uh, at one point, um, somebody calls out to him from the crowd, Blessed is the mother who bore you. Which in the traditional Jewish understanding was about the highest praise the, that a woman could get. Because a woman wasn't expected to participate in the Torah, wasn't, particip wasn't supposed to participate in the covenant with God, their role was to have good Jewish sons and teach their Jewish sons to participate in the Torah, to participate in the covenant of God. So that's like, in, in theory, the highest praise that you could give a, G a Jewish woman was, blessed is the mother who bore you. In other words, your mom, it looks to me like your mama raised you right. And Jesus responds, blessed is the one who knows my Father's word and keeps it. Jesus says uh, that women are supposed to participate in the Torah and in the covenant just like men are. It's really interesting to me, because, because both things are true. Uh, people who want to say, you know, I can't do Christianity uh, because Christianity is sexist, because Christianity upheld the institution of slavery. They're not wrong. Like, let's, let's be real about the Christian church's track record in the world it is not blameless or spotless, and a great deal of harm has been done to the world in the name of Jesus Christ. And the flip side is also true that there were Christian churches that were out there fighting to abolish slavery, that there were Christian pastors. Uh, you know, it was, it, was, it was the ancestors of this church, the Congregationalists, who paid for the attorneys for the, the slaves who rebelled on the honest God, that were out there uh, fighting to, to abolish slavery. The first abolitionists in New England met in Congregationalist churches. Um, you know, we, we ordained a, an African-American pastor back in the 1700s. Both sides of that are true. I think, I think that we, do, we kid ourselves when we say, you know, Christianity is just this unbridled force for good in the world. There has been a lot of harm carried out in the name of Jesus Christ. There has also been a lot of good carried out in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, Rachel Held Evans was a pastor who once said something to the effect of, uh, if you want to find passages in the Bible with which to support, uh, with which to oppress women, you will find them. And if you want to find passages in the Bible with which to liberate women, you will find them. If you want to find passages in the Bible that will condone violence, you will find them. And if you want to find passages in the Bible that will oppose violence, you will find them. And she concluded this by saying, uh, Perhaps the most important question when we read the Bible is not what does the Bible say, but what am I looking for it to say? Um, because, because there are both theologies in the Bible. There are theologies that condone slavery, and there are theologies that oppose slavery. There are theologies of liberating women, and there are theologies of oppressing women. But... One of the things that I think is really interesting 
once you look at it from that historical critical framework is that the closer we get to Jesus, the closer we get to the original church, to within one generation of Jesus Christ, when we're looking at the church, when it was made up of people who actually knew him, who met him face to face, who walked around Galilee with him, and talked to him, and touched him, and knew him, that church, that church is radically opposed to slavery. That church is radically interested in liberating women. And the further away you get from that, the more generations that pass, the more and more we get to the point to where when we're within, you know, a hundred years after Jesus, boy, the writers sound like any other Roman, don't they? Doesn't sound any different from the rest of the society around them. Nothing radical about it. Doing what every other slave owner patriarch is doing. And I guess that's, I think, the lesson for us, right, is not only does I, do I hope this gives you some idea of why we in the United Church of Christ do fight for the rights of women and do fight for racial equality in this country, is because, is because when we look at the scriptures, we, we hone in on those passages, and the reason that we hone in on those passages is because they're the ones that came first. They're the ones that were actually in the mouth of Jesus and the people who knew Jesus and walked with Jesus. And all that stuff about oppressing people that you'll find in the Bible, that stuff came a whole lot later. It came as the church decided that it was more important to maintain an institution and to make sure you didn't piss off the big givers. It was more important to maintain, it was more important to maintain the institution that it was to be a radical force for liberation and justice, which is what the earliest Christian church did, and it's why the earliest Christian church faced a lot of persecution. You ever notice that the Christian church kind of stopped getting persecuted? <laughs> why? Because they stopped being a radical force for liberation and justice because they stop challenging the powers that be and the way things are, and acclimated to the oppressive systems around them. And I guess that is, I think, the, the, the lesson for us. Not only, you know, how do you answer those people who say, oh, Christians are sexist. Well, I'm not, <laughs> um, and here's why. But, um, there is a terrible danger in putting the institution of the church above the mission of the church. Because the mission of the church is love. And as you're going to hear me say on Sunday, Jesus understood that love, when you apply it to political and economic and social structures, Love takes the form of justice. Love takes the form of liberation. Uh, that's what the earliest Christians were doing. That's what Jesus was up to. They killed him for it. Right? I mean, Jesus, Jesus wasn't crucified because he was like, hey man, love everybody, and stop there. Like, that's, that's, that's hippie nonsense, you know? There's, there's tens of thousands of people all around the world all the time, like, ah, oh, just love everybody, it's all good, man. Like, if that's all the more Jesus said and did, he'd live to be an old man. But Jesus said, love everyone. And sometimes loving slaves means you have to free the slaves, and sometimes loving women means you have to put them on equal footing with men, and, Sometimes loving the poor means that you have to start challenging the legal and economic systems that keep the, making the rich richer while the poor get poorer. And they kill them for it. It's interesting that it hasn't changed in 2,000 years. No, it hasn't. Uh, that's always the challenge of the church, right? 
we, we want a church to grow. We want more people in church. We want bigger budgets. We want more, more money in the offering plate, and more butts in pews. And, and those are all things that we should strive for, right? I mean, Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, right? We're supposed to be bringing people to Christ. We're supposed to be growing this church. But it wasn't just get them to church. It was make disciples of all nations. Make followers of Jesus of all people. Um, and that's the danger for us is when we start to put the institution of the church ahead of the mission of the church. That was the temptation that the earliest Christians succumbed to. Within three to four generations of Jesus, you go from this source of, of radical justice and equality to women shut up and have babies. So that, that has always been, you know, one of the things that, that I, am, I am often asked about, like, do you consider so-and-so Christian, right? Like, I mean, this is, this is an argument, like, if you, if you listen to, like, the real far-out evangelical radio stations, like, you'll hear things about Catholics aren't really Christians. Um, and, and, you know, you get Mormons aren't really Christian, you know, fill in the blank. Basically, basically anybody who's not us is not really a Christian. Um, and I get that question a lot of, like, what, 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 is, what is sort of the, the minimum, what, what makes somebody a Christian or not? Uh, and my answer to that question has always been uh, that to be a Christian means that you have a belief that when you want to know God, you look to Jesus. Right? That's what Christians believe, that Jesus was God incarnate, God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. That's what we read in, in, in the introduction to John's Gospel, right? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Nobody has ever seen God. It is God the Son who is close to the Father's heart who has made him known. I believe in God, but God is is invisible, his spirit is not, um, you can't just sit down with God and a pen and a piece of paper and take God's thoughts on things down. Um, that when, that's what we as Christians believe Jesus was, was Jesus was somebody who was totally in sync with the will and ways of God. And so when we want to know God, we look to Jesus. I have no problem saying that I reject parts of Scripture as not inspired by God. And the way that I say I reject those parts of Scriptures as not inspired by God is because I can look at Jesus saying the exact opposite of what you find over here, right? If, if, if Jesus says something and, and this is over here contradicting Jesus, I'm going to go with Jesus. Jesus. 